Today is the 14th of Tishrei, the 16th of October. We're on page 254, Shor Mitzvah Satfila, Derech Mitzvah Secha. Okay. And then we said, Inyan Modim Anach Nulach, maybe what, what, one more line above that. It's uh, about 15 lines from the bottom, 12 lines from the bottom. Ulemala Ubchinat Ein Shenom Musag. And the reason, like we said, that we call the source of everything nothingness is not because it's nothingness, but because it's not perceived. We can't grasp it. We don't understand it. Like we said about our, or, our origins, we don't, we don't know. Um, very interesting that, just thinking that the human species as a whole also has the same question. Where did we come from? It's a, it's a question all the time. You mean the going is? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Why, who cares? Like, what, what does it matter? And you got all this mythology over it. Like, where did we come from? And modern mythology. I'm talking about modern mythology. Science fiction deals with this all the time. I mean, I think it's just an innate human right? drive. It is, because there's something missing. Where did I come from? <laughs> you, feel, you feel the lack. I you found the DNA at this island Watson Creek. I'm sorry, what, 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 either Watson or Creek who discovered the DNA. Yeah, 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 correct. So they, they, they asked him, he was an atheist. So they asked him, like, did this DNA, can it, can it evolve? He said, no way, even the world would be billions and billions, billion to how billion years. Interesting. So they asked him, like, so. How did we get her? from extraterrestrial beings. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the modern mythology. The yeah. modern mythology <laughs> sees it that way. Very interesting. Very, very interesting that they, the interesting that they had a better understanding of the DNA probably than uh, they have it today. Because we see that uh, the variations are very minor. They're not... Uh, anyway. V'inyan modim anachnu lach hainu sh'anu modim sh'emetu k'mo sh'hu kamei dbarach sh'lemala yesh ve'lemata ha'ayin And the reason we say in Shmon Esra modim anachnu lach and we bow down what, do we, what does modim anachnu lach mean? It means we acknowledge to you or we admit to you what do we admit? What do we acknowledge? That the way that you see things, your perspective, Hashem, is the correct perspective. That above is the something, is the being, and below is the nothingness. Again, the nothingness here is not to, not to be understood as we, we don't exist. Because that, that's also a sayetzer, that's also a, a thought of the, of the evil inclination. The evil inclination wants you to feel like you're dust, you're nothing. You're insignificant and you're irrelevant. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that uh, you're irrelevant at all. It doesn't mean that you don't exist. You can't take off the burden of existence from yourself. What it means is that, that man's path to perfection, or to at least betterment, passes through the feeling of nothingness. And what is that feeling? So that in Chassidus is always explained as Atsia Sheol Hineka. That I will go down into the depths of Sheol. Sheol is a word that at least the non Jews understand as being a synonym. Not the, the Gemara also, but they take it mamish as a synonym for hell. The Gemara says Sheol is just where the Kevil, where the person dies. So if the person dies, then he finds God. What do you mean? What, I find God after I, I die? No, so the meaning is, like, 
we talked about this when Alexander was in, in the land of Israel when he came here. So he met Shimon Atzadik, and he asked him, because I learned from my teacher, from uh, Plato, from Aristotle, that there's eudaimonia, eudaimonia, which means the good soul. Eo is good, daimonia is the soul, is the, the anima inside. So how does a person reach having that good spirit inside of him? Yeah, what today we call ethics. So Shimon Atzadik said to him, If a person wants to live, yamut. He has to die. What do you mean you have to die? There's a lot of things in me that need to die for me to be able to live. The first and foremost thing that needs to die for me to live is my feeling of being separate from God. That independence has to die. Then. Yeah, right. It, now you can't kill the ego because no, you can't live without, without it. it. But I'm saying so it's not exactly it, the ego. But, but it's, it's, it's the part of us that feels see, that it doesn't need anyone. Right. Especially not God. <laughs> my wife maybe I need, but my God, he, he certainly I don't need. So that has to die. That, that has to... And this is the, the, the trouble with our world, that the most we can do is give an intellectual or emotional acknowledgement to God that his perspective is right. But we can't see it that way. We don't have the ability in this body, in this flesh and blood body, to see things from God's perspective. So because of this, because every creature sees itself as something that exists, it has being, and it is separate from everything else, especially from its origin from God. That's why it's called a Bria, it's called a creation, which we said that in Hebrew means Shenivra Mitziut Davao. Means it was created and it feels like something out of nothing. That's, that's what it feels like. So this is, it was a long, long uh, uh, elevation of what the Ramban says on the first Pasuk of the Torah. That in Bereshit Bara, we don't have any other verb in Hebrew except for Bara in order to signify something coming from nothing. And again, what it means is, it could be that in the Ramban's time it meant something else. But once Hasidus hit, so the, you have to, re, like we said, Hasidus is rewriting the dictionary. So what was before understood as being from non-being is now understood as something from nothing, where the nothingness is not that it's non-being, but rather that it's imperceptible, it's ungraspable. I can't understand my origin. <laughs> And this has two parts to it, like we said. The one is my origin, and the second is what's sustaining my life right now. That I also, I don't, I can't perceive fully. There's no perception of it. I can feel it to some extent, but I don't really understand it. But the world of emanation, and whenever we say emanation, there we mean a state of mind where it is possible to know and to perceive, to is to perceive exactly the fact that I'm not separate, that I'm not a separate being. Uftelim keziv Hashemesh b'shemesh, and we're and and the person then feels, or the crea- creation there feels that it's like the radiance of the sun within the sun. Lachen lo sheyachad ze kokach lashon bria rak lashon atziud kanal. Therefore. It's not so relevant to talk about it as being Bria, as being creation. You have to talk about it as being emanation. Now, the only trick that I know, that I've found, that helps with this, is to look at yourself through the mirror. <laughs> and to look at your reflection in the mirror. And try to feel what the reflection feels. Meaning, you have some emotions, now try to project those emotions on, on, the, on the mirror image, and your own mirror image, the way you are, and you'll see that you can't. It's very, very difficult. So if I look at the world through the mirror, I lose my sense of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. I don't feel that I'm the... It's the same person. It's, It's still me. It's just a reflection of me. But if I try to identify with that, it'll be just another fixture in everything that's reflected in the mirror. But it's me, I know that it's me. Probably that's even how self-consciousness begins when you see yourself in the mirror. 
It probably takes a longer time if you never see yourself in the mirror. Right, because of the, it's a asr, according to Allah. But for this, it's important to do it. I was once in a... Yeah, logically, you know, a man should not look in the mirror. They showed him a picture of himself. A whole bunch of people. So he, I know. He said, this, this guy has a lot of Yerat Shemayim. So again, that's you. Angry <laughs> because he, you know, he had never seen him never in the mirror. Ah. And never ah. had a photograph, nothing. So he yes. didn't know it was him. Wow. He was angry with his grandchildren. Wow. They, they, they showed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a photograph me made of it. Why are you showing me? Why do I need to see it? ETL once told me a joke about this. He's a friend of ours. So he said... A person has to come to a situation where, where they show him a picture of his family. He says, what a beautiful picture. There's only one part here that's not so, <laughs> not so straight. <laughs> Me. <laughs> the one that's like the odd, odd man out. Um, I was in uh, Venice uh, a while ago, and then uh, they did a reconstruction of uh, Da Vinci had an eight-room mirror, an uh, eight-wall mirror. So you go in and you see yourself from eight sides. And so because they reflect and re-reflect and so on, so there's many, 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 I try to take many pictures of it. And that, that is a parable for many, many things. But one of the things it did was, ah, there's many like you. You're not such a big uh, find. <laughs> you can make a hundred like you in a second. Not unique. Uh, yeah, it's not such a big deal. The other thing is uh, Rabbi Isaac of Homel, he used to, he, in his time they started having merry-go-rounds were working, I guess, on steam or I don't know on what. And um, he said that moment of getting on the merry-go-round, the moment that you suddenly are rotating around a different center, says that moment is the moment of losing your self-centeredness. Afterwards, you you get it back, even when you're on the merry-go-round. Otherwise, you get vertigo. So you get vertigo. Yeah. 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 But most people, uh, the, the the brain compensates yeah, for it, right. and then you feel like you're the center of the world again on your horse. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. But that moment when you're still compensating with a, when when it's accommodating, that's a moment of losing that you self-centeredness. So again, the most important thing here is Malchus Datsilus, that's what we call Dibur, we call that speech. And here he gives us the reason for this. The, the, re, the, the way that Hashem makes there a creation that feels separate is through the Malchus of Atsilus, the, the, the kingdom of emanation. That's its duty. Its duty is to, in a sense, create this image that I am something separate. Okay. How does it do it? So first of all, we said before that it's, it's, um, it, it's our speech, Hashem's speech, and our speech for us. We'll, we'll talk about that more later. But here he gives the reason for it. Why did Hashem want there to be in the first place something that feels separate from Him? What good is that? So he says that's one of the four reasons for creation. This reason is the simplest one. Ki en melech am. You can't have a king if there is no people. If there's no nation that he's ruling. And it says you can't rule things that are an extension of yourself. It does, it's, it's, it's like not being a king. So in Chassidus they say you can't be a king over your children. Because your children are an extension of you. you you'd never rule over them uh, the way you'd rule over people who are separate from you, not, not from the family, not anything. That's real rulership. So Hashem, in order to be a king, to have real sovereignty, he had to have beings that are separate from him. On the other hand, you can't rule over ants. <laughs> it means meaningless. So there has to be a sentient being who feels separate from you. Okay? So Hashem has to create something that feels separate. It's sentient, it's uh, conscious, but it feels that it's separate. So that's called En Melech B'loam. That's one of the simplest reasons for creation. And that's why we call this Malchus Datsilus is called sometimes the world of revelation or the revealed world. Why? 
because only in it, in the kingdom of emanation, and then what it creates, the three lower worlds, the kingdom of emanation has the power to reveal the infinite revelation of Hashem. Only it has, meaning in other words, that interestingly, anybody who is in the consciousness of the world of emanation does not perceive God's infinite revelation. They only perceive a part of it. Uh, we, we mentioned this. This is discussed, this is one of the big chidushim of Hasidus. To understand Kabbalah this way. This was, I don't think this was understood so well before uh, the Alter Rebbe came along. And that was Epistle 20 that we just read two weeks ago in the Tanya. He says that the Malchus of Atzilus and the way that it acts is not Seder Ishtalshulus. It's not what we call the order of evolution, the order of things coming down in cause and effect. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because it's revealing the infinite. To reveal the infinite, you have to have a quantum leap. Because the infinite doesn't fit in this world. Meaning, in other words, if, if you would be um, in the world of emanation, what you see is... An exten- you're an extension, you're the, again, like the radiance of the sun. So you're an extension of the sun. You don't feel what the sun looks like from the outside. You can't see its infinite radiance. You're part of it. So you can't see it. So you're always nullified in it. it you, you never can really appreciate it. Sort of like people couldn't appreciate the earth until you send a satellite, satellite out and then you photograph it, and then you realize, wait a minute, this thing is pretty amazing. So you have to somehow get out of it completely in order to have perspective on it. But here what he's saying is that Malchus of Atilus has the power to create something that feels that it's infinite. <laughs> Meaning, it's not connected to anything else. To be infinite in a certain sense is like to be not connected. I, I'm, I'm me, I'm, I'm everything I am, I don't need anything else. How does, how does Malchus of Atsilus do that? How does the kingdom of an emanation do it? So he says, Hashem has to give it the power of the revelation of the infinite. To rev- but it's only revelation of the infinite. It's Orensof. It's not, and it's even the Koach of Orensof. It, it, it's a couple times removed, but the whole thing is that it gives us our consciousness this feeling that somehow we're not connected, we're, we're independent, we're infinite. That's what the Malchus of Atilus has the power to give. Okay. It's not really a, a truly separate creation. Although we said when it comes to material matters, then it is. And that Hashem has to create Himself. But Malchus of Atilus is what gives the consciousness, the feeling, the sense that it's independent, that somehow it's, it's, it's not related to Hashem. And that's different than the Teisha Sfirot HaRishonot Neetzlu B'Ishtalshelut Ila Ve'alul. Ve'ore En Sof Melubash B'Chokma Levadad Kan Neshono. And in the second part of Tanya he says that this is different than the first nine Sfirot of Emanation, of Atzilus, from Chokma down to Yesod. And there, they don't have the uh, revelation of the infinite. And they were created knowing what their origin is. Constantly knowing what their origin is. And so because they know their origin, they're not really separate. They, 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 can't, they can't think that way, that they're separate. Yet, the infinite does dwell in them, but only through the sphere of Chochmah, only through king, uh, uh, wisdom. And that needs to be explained a little bit more, and he's going to explain it, and we'll see this, God willing, on Friday. So we're, I hope we're continuing on Friday. I don't know what your plans are. I plan to be here. I think yeah. I think it's a date. Uh, usual. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So God willing, we'll start. We'll continue as usual on Friday. Chag yeah. to everyone who's watching. Yeah.